Good morning, everyone. This is Penny, and I am on the Conservation Training and Membership Services Coordinator at Wisconsin Land and Water, and we're glad you're joining us today. And today our presenters are going to be Amy Minzer, Kim Gonzalez, and Chris Homburg. And these webinars are being provided by the State Interagency Training Committee, which is commonly known as SITCOM. So first, Amy Minzer, she is a professional engineer and is a storm water engineer from the Wisconsin DNR in the Northeast region. She has been with DNR since 2013, and her responsibilities include municipal and construction site storm water discharge permitting and review of urban storm water grant deliverables. And prior to coming to the DNR, Amy worked for 15 years as a transportation design engineer for private consulting firms in the Buffalo, New York area. And then next we'll have C. Kimberly Gonzalez, and she is a professional engineer licensed in California and is employed as a water resources engineer at the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Kim joined the department in 2014 after working in the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Regulatory Program in California for five years, and more recently working as a consulting engineer focusing on Department of Defense environmental compliance and remediation projects. At the department, Kim leads and participates in development of technical standards and guidance documents relating to urban runoff and is a statewide contact for utility storm water permitting. And then we'll have Chris Homburg. He is a professional engineer and is the president of Homburg Contractors Incorporated, which is a public work site work contracting company located in Dane County, Wisconsin, and is a green tier clear waters initiative participant. Chris is a 1977 graduate of the University of Wisconsin in Madison with a degree in civil and environmental engineering. And I think that's about it. I'm going to be turning it now over to to Amy. So Amy, you can unmute yourself if you're still muted, and you can take over. Hi, this is actually Kate Brunner speaking first. Um, oh, okay. I am the SAC program manager, um, and I just wanted to briefly introduct or introduce what we are doing here. Um, SAC is an interagency collaboration. We develop teams for each standard that include. Uh, representatives from federal, state, uh, or local government, and also includes some private sector uh, engineers, landowners, um, and other technical representatives. Um, these standards are developed usually over a year-long process, um, and it's a very uh, thorough, transparent process. It ensures uniform standards that are usable um, and also helps reduce risks to the agencies, to the public, and to the landowners. Um, and hopefully we, we come up with an end product that's, that's put into practice and is usable for um, the contractors in this case. Um, Amy and others will be speaking today about um, the track out control practices standard. So Amy, you can go ahead. Thank you, Kate. Um, so, uh, the, the update to the standards kind of started with a phone call. Um, back in 2016, I, I got a phone call about a site that was more than an acre, and it sounded like something I needed to investigate. So I went to find the site, and it was, it was rather easy to find. Um, they had taken delivery of 8,000 cubic yards of material over the course of two to three days. And as you can see in the picture, there was quite a bit of track out. And um, so it, there was so much track out, I decided to document the um, trail of dirt starting at the site. And this picture here is um, where the road crosses an impaired waterway. And you can see how much dirt is is there. And so the site was down here. The trail of dirt went all the way up. This is a picture from the from the intersection, and it ended a mile and a half from the site entrance. 
And I got to thinking, you know, if the site had actually had the proper permits before they started, would this level of track out have been prevented given the, the uh, conditions that were there at the time? And that led to the question, do we need to update the current technical standard? So, um, so a technical standard is really um, a document that tries to set people up for success using current research field experience and best available technology so that each individual doesn't have to figure it out for themselves. It's, it's a document that the agency makes available and puts together and um, it's public noticed and it, we're, we're really just trying to lay out what needs to be done um, in order to plan, design, and install conservation practices. So this one was last updated in 2003. And it had, it was called stone tracking pad and tire washing. So there was two options, the tire washing being rather expensive and therefore very rarely used. And the stone tracking pad um, was not, was frequently not maintained to the level it needed to be. And um, also, since 2003, there, there's been some changes in construction vehicles and methodologies. So that's one of the thing. that's one of the conversations that's driven our upgrade. The other thing we've seen a lot of lack of planning or execution where people have made their own entrances or added changed entrances and not added track out control, use too small a stone, not enough stone, and were the ground soft and they needed a geotextile under the stone, a lot of times it wasn't installed. So we ended up with a lot of failed stone tracking pads. And if you don't know what a failed tracking pad looks like, uh, this is a picture. It's full of sediment, it's compacted, there is deep ruts. And once it fails, you see the evidence on the streets. And then it's clogging up the stormwater systems and um, filling the gutters with dirt, which then washes off into the streams. And the other challenge with the track out control is that on, on many sites, there's some access that needs to be maintained to private private residences. In, in this case, on the in the left side of this picture, there's a private residence that they were trying to maintain access to. And the three to six inch stone is, is bigger than most people want to drive their private cars on. And because there wasn't any um, other good options, Sometimes people were feeling like they needed to remove existing pavement to put in the tracking pad stone. Weren't sure that completely made sense either. So, um, so we decided that this needed a major update. And the, the first step was to form a team of subject experts. And this is kind of the pro process we went through where we, we put together a draft, we got some initial review from some key parties, um, refined the standard, put it out for public comment, refined it again before publishing it. And this is the, this is the team that worked on it. Have a couple of um, municipal stormwater people, a green tier co contractor you'll hear from later, um, a county stormwater person, a consultant with um, with national with contacts that ha with national experts, our SOC coordinator at the time, and a couple DNR staff people. 
And now I'm going to hand this off to Kim Gonzalez, and she's going to talk about the standard layout and the first part of the technical standard. Thank you, Amy. So just like our other technical standards, the track out control standard is organized in the typical format, which includes the sections shown here. And as you may have noticed, this revised technical standard now includes several different practices that can be implemented separately or in series. For our webinar today, we'll first go through some of the information that's applicable to all practical all practices included in the standard, and then spend some time on each of the different practices. So let's start with some definitions of terms found in the standard. Track out control is a practice or a combination of practices used to prevent, reduce, or mitigate track out of sediment. Within that definition is the term track out which the standard defines as the relocation of material from its intended location to off-site surfaces by vehicles. And for the purposes of this standard, vehicle includes cars, trucks, and other equipment capable of moving persons or property, and a vehicle can have either tires or tracks. The purpose of this track out controls technical standard is to identify common methods which may be used to prevent, reduce, and or mitigate the tracking of sediment. The criteria section of the standard includes general criteria applicable to all track out practices, followed by practice specific criteria. When revising the standard, the team decided it was important to include more options for controlling track out and we also agreed that the track out issue is best managed by implementing controls in the order shown here. First, to prevent track out from occurring whenever possible by restricting at least some construction traffic to stabilize surfaces. Then to use controls that reduce the potential for track out by removing sediment from, from vehicle tires and tracks. And finally, if those efforts are not completely successful, or if site constraints are such that other measures are not possible, the last effort is to mitigate any incidental track out that may occur. Additionally, the general criteria relevant to any track out control practice requires that you select a device capable of supporting the vehicle load, and if needed, provide an alternate stabilized egress for oversized or overweight vehicles. Provide stable approaches to the practice from either direction. Provide a stable driving surface from the practice to the off-site road or street. Limit water use to minimize the discharge of sediment and apply dust control measures when necessary. Now we'll take a look at each of the different types of practices included in the revised standard. You can see here which ones we've added. They're marked as new. And I'll start us off with the stabilized work surface practice. Stabilized work surfaces are a preventative measure in that they prevent vehicles from coming in contact with bare soil, mud, and areas susceptible to rutting. Stabilized work surfaces can be used on one or more portions of a site or just during certain phases, depending on site conditions. In the photos here, you can see gravel being used to create stabilized areas for parking and trailers. To implement this standard, install practices that prevent vehicles from coming in contact with exposed soils. Matting products like manufactured mats or timber mats are commonly used on utility construction projects. The matting products go by various names and they come in different sizes and materials. Some can be locked together and most are reusable. But stabilized surfaces for purposes of this standard don't have to be matting. They can also include gravel, as we saw in the previous slide, or even existing new paved areas, existing or new paved areas. Um, sometimes signs or fences or both will be needed to communicate the intended use of the area and also to control vehicle access. This practice can potentially be used alone to effectively prevent track out, but 
if it isn't maintained, the department or the municipal inspector may require additional practices to be implemented. Here's a photo of composite matting used for stabilized access through private property. Stabilized surfaces can be effective for preventing unnecessary soil contact in staging or laydown areas, parking areas, work areas, access roads, and with appropriate permits, matting can even be used for crossing wetlands and waterways. When using gravel as your stabilized work surface, be sure to specify in your stormwater permit application if the gravel areas will be temporary or permanent. Since gravel is considered an impervious surface, it may be subject to Wisconsin's post-construction performance standards if left in place after construction. Here's an example setup, including both a gravel stabilized work surface and a tracking pad. Um, notice that the tracking pad is um, located between the active construction area, the brown area here, and the stabilized work area, so that it will knock vehicle off, um, or knock mud off vehicles before they enter the gravel area. You can use fences, barriers, and signs as needed to control traffic through the stabilized area. Here's a photo showing use of timber matting as a stabilized work surface for a large pipeline project. And finally, with respect to operation and maintenance of this practice, the standard specifies um, to monitor stabilized work surfaces for soil deposits, standing water and damage, to remove soil deposits daily through scraping and or pavement cleaning, uh, to chop dress gravel surfaces as needed, and to replace or repair damaged mats. This concludes the stabilized work surface section. I will now hand it over to Chris Homburg, who will cover the remaining practices. Thanks, Kim. Hello, everyone. Um, how do I slide this? Right there? This one? Or down? Remedial. There we go. Sorry. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a few of the other practices. Before I start, I want to say what you're all thinking. We used to have a standard that was a page and a half. Half of that was mandatory things that had to be said. So we basically had about three quarters of a page of what we needed to do for track out. Now we've given you a standard that's 10 pages. Take out three diagrams and some of the mandatory. We've gone from less than a page to five pages. And as a contractor, I'm like, oh man, that's just why I need more regulations. You're going to tell me, tell me how I'm supposed to do things. Well, this standard is almost the opposite of that. This standard is giving you more options. This is a really a performance driven standard. It's up to you to decide how you're going to control your track out. What this does is it gives you a lot more options, some more tools and some more experiences on how things have worked. So when you look at that, I, I think what you need to look at in the future is I have options. I have different ways I can control my track out. And as long as you control it, like I say, it's a performance. So what there's a picture up here right now is a tracking pad and it's not a standard tracking pad this was actually one of our test sites where the team came and we looked at a bunch of different practices um where do i get the mount there it is so right here where you see the truck that's some of the three inch stone that's specified in the standard if you went over this way if you could see there we had some of the five to six inch stones that was specified and we had some one inch over here that we tried we wanted to try a lot of different stones see how they performed and the whole team wanted to see them under different situations work perfectly on this day because we'd gotten a lot of rain you can see it's a heavy clay site the truck just picked up all kinds of mud so the first thing i guess i should talk about too is before we started we did some research we tried to do our homework and, and part of our research was local within the state we said what are people doing and how does it work? And do you really even understand how a tracking pad is supposed to work? And, and it was shocking how many people did not understand and all the stories the team brought back. Lots of people were rolling and compacting tracking pads. That's of course the opposite of what we'd like to see. Right there is 
of course, a perfect situation. What do we do? We set this thing up how we want it to look, but it is a fresh tracking pad with loose stone. And then you can see where the tire is coming in there. It's actually pushing the stone a little bit. It's actually got a little coming up against the site. And that's the whole purpose of a tracking pad. The purpose isn't to be a flat, beautiful surface like you see behind here where it's a gravel area. The purpose is to be a little flexible for the stone to be loose. What happens is it flexes the tire. It flexes the sides of the tires. The tires has to push a little bit through that stone and that's what helps loosen the soil from the tire. So the first thing we need to make sure everybody understands is what is it supposed to do and how is it supposed to look. We had one team member that had rip wrap or not rip wrap the five inch stone actually grouted on their site because the trucks were having so much trouble getting through it. Well it, it still does some cleaning but it doesn't move and work the way stone should. So a stone tracking pad works really well but a stone tracking pad as we're going to talk about needs a lot of maintenance because after a truck like this drives over there and you have a dozen two dozen loads on there it's going to start look like looking like a compacted gravel road and once you get to that it's not really functioning the way you want it to function you want it loose so when we say for maintenance you need to loosen it soften it up add a little stone that's why we do that one of the reasons we went to the 12 inch stone this is back to the original tracking pad is we looked at going six inch stone on smaller sites, but when you have six inches of stone, I'm sorry, on smaller sites, but when you have only six inches of stone, there's not enough room for those stones to work together and work those tires. So we went back to the 12 inch thickness as a minimum because you have enough stone, but now we have to look at gradation, right? And that's always a big issue. And the reason we tried the one inch, we tried to we tried out a gap graded material. In other words, virtually all one inch stone because we knew it would work the tires, but could you get through it? And of course the answer we thought we'd find out we did. You had to take a running start with a truck to get through it. So when you look at these preferred gradations, you'll see it, it it's, yes, it's three inch stone, but a lot of it passes two and a half. There's still a fairly substantial component. Half of it passes the inch and a half screen more or less and there's still 20 up to 20 percent that can pass the three quarter you need a gradation of stone in there so vehicles can actually get through there without just spinning down in so this is the stone that we ended up on and there was a lot of discussion we call it the preferred stone because our experience our tests and more than anything our feedback we got through initial review and broad reviews said this stone has been working the best for people. And, and a lot of it back, goes back to what Amy said. It's really hard to get through this stone with very small vehicles. Now, I'm, this is a great stone. It's worked for a long time. This is actually DOT Select Crush. This spec came from the DOT manual. They've used it for years very successfully. Will it work? Absolutely. It, it's a good product. We just think in a lot of situations where you need to get private vehicles and things through, this might work a little bit better for you. This stone might work around the tires a little bit better. The DOT works with a lot of really large vehicles. This stone size for their large vehicles works great. For, for a small car, it doesn't work so well. So the way the standard is set up, it doesn't say mandatory, it says preferred. You, you sh we think you will set yourself up for the best chance of success if you can use this stone, it's not available throughout the state of Oregon. It's easy to manufacture. Any manufacturer that has a three inch screen anywhere from a inch, inch and a quarter, inch and a half inch screen can make this stone. It's, it's not complicated. But what we want to do with the standards, we don't want to make it more expensive for you to be able to succeed. We want to make it so you had options and you could do this with local material. This isn't a local material. A lot of times this is. If this isn't a local material, you probably have a local material that's similar to these. Don't knock somebody out because they're off by 5% on one gradation. Look, what we're looking for is a clear stone with a larger size with some gradations so you can drive through it and without very many fines. If you look at the preferred stone, it's only zero to 5% in the three A's. That's, that's a pretty good size stone chip. In the DOT material, zero to 10 on the number 10. It's a little finer, but again, it's manufactured differently. Generally, this is not a screen material. Generally, this is just run through a jaw that's set at five inches is why you can see pieces like this that might be eight inches that can still slide through the jaw. Whereas with this, this has actually gone through a screen. So I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions on stone size, but that's some of the some of the reasons that we decided on this size, but please, when you're specifying it, use local materials. Use something that's local, that's similar to this, that will work and that you've had good experience with. So this is uh, the, sl the 
slide you've probably all seen except for wow it's it's 12 foot wide instead of 25 what's happening there the old side minimum traffic tracking pad had to be 50 by 25 right 12 12 inches thick well we went with 12 because we're really not here to tell you how much you can track into your site we're worried about what you track out of your site and because we added other measures such as the manufactured devices which the standard size in those is 12 foot we ended up on the 12 foot for the tracking pad you run your trucks what 70 miles an hour down the interstate on a 12 foot lane we figure you ought to be able to get it at 5 to 10 miles an hour over a tracking pad the same width so 12 foot is the minimum would it be better wider sure if you were a little bit wider, the trucks could vary a little bit. They wouldn't all be in the same track. Your pad would last longer. These are your design concerns. It's up to you to decide how you want to build this and how you build it will determine how long it lasts for the number of trips you have. If you have a lightly used site with very few loads, especially heavy trucks, this will probably be fine. If you're going to have a lot of heavy hauling, you might want to be a little wider than this. You want to have it so that they can vary and that you don't have to replace or refresh this pad right away. As I mentioned before, we stuck with the 12 inches and that's that you have enough depth of stone so the stones will move, they'll work on each other, which ultimately we want them to work your tires. Geotextile as needed, another controversial item. A lot of, lot of you out there, you swear, by, you swear by geotextile, you will put it under everything. And that's great. If that's the way you like to build things, put geotextile under everything. Some people feel like they can have issues with it. It might block a little drainage when they don't want it to, or, or they're on a very hard surface and they don't need it everywhere. That's why we left it as an option. Obviously on soft ground, you're going to want to put it in. But there's some situations, a sandy soil or something where you may not need it. And so it, again, is up to you to give you the best chance to succeed on your design. Culvert is needed. Uh, I, obviously, you just as soon not have water running over this. We're not going to come here and tell you that you cannot have water run over it, but design it to succeed, design it to last. You want to keep it loose, you want to keep it fresh. So maintenance, I think I've talked about some of what Amy did, but compaction, that's the one thing we found the most confusion on. You do not want it compact. You want to loosen it up. Soil, obviously, you have to get rid of. The, the mixing uh, is another one. Loosened rough surface, it's, it's all the same. If it gets bad enough, you're going to have to replace it where the cursor is. And, and that's what you don't want to do. And I think I blew by something I wanted to talk to on a couple slides earlier. I don't know. I need to go back, but I'll try. No, it's maybe it's going to be the next one. Well, somewhere in here, it talks about the stone that you're going to use. And I've probably blown by it. And you can use crushed concrete. And crushed concrete works great for this. So one thing I will caution you on is try to use concrete that doesn't have steel in it. A lot of, a lot of crushed concrete has wire in it. And we're not being very sustainable. We're not saving anything when we recycle concrete to put it in a tracking pad and then we poke a bunch of wires through a bunch of tires because those tires are expensive. So again, use your head. When, when we use it for a, a entrance or a tracking pad, we will put aside curbs, uh, some sidewalks that don't have any steel, things like that. We'll, we'll make it out of that. And it works great. It's a fabulous product, but be a little careful when you use the crushed concrete. It's allowed, but try not to puncture too many tires. This is kind of humorous, but it, it, it's a great reminder. Uh, please check your dualies and clean any stones out. Another thing that has to do with the stone size, no matter what stone you pick, there will be some set of duels that will try to pick that up and take it off site. And, and that's a problem. Obviously, we, we don't want to do that. Our experience was the stone on the right, when we did our testing on the slide I showed you earlier, that caught a lot easier in the duels of the larger trucks. That this the way the tires are spaced, we picked up a lot of that. The stone on the left catches much easier in the duels of the smaller trucks, the what you'd call the one tons, the delivery truck, but you still have a lot of those on a site. So something you have to be very cognizant of, something you have to watch, and, and, and a lot of this is education for the people that are using your sites, is make sure you, you look for that. You, you can hear it clicking as soon as you leave a site. You can take and chuck, check it, which this one slide is great at, check your dualies, make sure you don't have it. These are all the things that you do when you design your site for success is, is try to think of things like that. So now we are on to manufactured devices. Now, I said we did some research and 
we have some really brilliant people in Wisconsin. We have lots of creative people, but we don't have all of the best answers and we don't have all the best ideas. So we actually looked outside of Wisconsin. We looked all over the nation on what were people doing? Are they doing things we're not doing or is there something we should look at? Manufactured devices is one that we had not seen a lot of in the state, but when we started checking, especially on the West Coast and some areas in Colorado, they were using these in some areas on the West Coast, these were actually specified as mandatory. And what it is, the uh, one on the top right, I should be manipulating my cursor a little more, it's, it's really a, a glorified cattle crossing, if you've ever seen a cattle crossing. What it does is it, it flexes the tire treads and it rattles you, and it tries to shake things off. Um, there are a lot of manufacturers that make something similar to this, Very, a lot of them. We tested these two because in talking to the manufacturers, they both donated them to us to test so we could see how they work for our technical standard and see if it's something we want to include. It's, if, we, if it's something we even thought had a chance of working and, and we would want to allow for, for track out control. Obviously they're in here, so, so we've had some success. Are they a silver bullet? Absolutely not, absolutely not. The stone, fresh, probably does a better job than either of these. But I will tell you this, after a thousand truckloads over this, that grade is still the same. After a thousand loads over that, those FODs are still the same. So the give and take on these is that you may not be quite as good at removing the sediment, but it will be just as good after many, many loads. They both need to be cleaned, of course, but they go a long time before they need to be cleaned. On the uh, examples we had, on, especially on the West Coast, they had a mandatory 24 feet. We've had a lot of questions. Why did you specify 32 feet? Why 32, right? What, what a silly number. Well, most of these are manufactured in eight foot widths. So we go on, on increments of eight foot and 24 feet is what they wanted to see on the West Coast as a minimum. Our experience with the, these was that we didn't feel it was doing a good enough job at 24. We increased both of them to 32. We felt we were doing better. Now, having said that, you look at it, that's a minimum. That's your bare minimum. It depends on how many cars, your loads, what, what you're going to have going over it. I would recommend, and what we've done since we've been testing them, is we would probably still have a tracking pad out here another 50 feet because this stone really helps to start loosening up the sediment and the soil on the tires. And when you get on this, it flexes the tread and rattles it, and you can probably shake a lot of it off. This one, the same thing. And we'll have a slide here, it might be next, that shows this is my truck, but we, we, we uh, had one of the smallest pool cars that the city of Madison has and ran it over there and it runs on there just fine. People are afraid of it in the beginning. On this particular site, we had to actually put up signage and fencing to get people to drive over this. They did not want to drive over it. Once they got used to it, it was hilarious. It, 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 unintended benefit from this, the ready mix trucks would actually stop on this. I don't know if you can tell from the slide, there's a bit of a slope coming back and there's a four bay down here that led to the sedimentation basin. They would stop on these FODs and they would get out their hose and they'd wash their tires off on the FODs and clean them up and then leave the site. Worked fabulous and you could do the exact same thing on this as long as you have your drainage covered. So, so we had unintended benefits from these that we did not expect. So, the point of that is we will learn more about these. We, we, we made our best effort from what we could learn from other states and what we could learn in our limited amount of testing to see what we think might work. Again, it's up to you. Design for success and design for the least amount of maintenance you can. So some of the advantages, modular and reusable. Everybody wants to know, what am I gonna spend? I, I think you'll spend for most of these or these, you'll probably for a set to get 32 feet, you'll probably spend 10, $12,000. I'm like, wow, that's a lot of money, but how much money do you spend on rock? And you can take this and you can use it five years from now. You can use it this year, next year, the year after, multiple jobs, you pick it up, it's fairly easy. This is thousands of pounds, you need equipment. These are hundreds of pounds. They're totally different types of system. These probably need to be anchored. And you'll see in the standard where it talks, you probably can't see it, this is the head of an anchor. It's the same kind of thing you might use on a camper. They're fairly inexpensive to put up a system like this on that site. I would probably spend $100, $125 in anchors. That's what, not even a load of stone. And as you can see, they're strapped together, but these are only 
a few hundred pounds, so a couple people can lift them and flip them. They both have their own advantages. One thing we want to be very clear on is these are not approved systems by the DNR or anyone else. These are recommendations where you can succeed if you use it. We do not approve, the DNR does not approve these. If you have another system that looks like it will work about the same as these, it will flex treads and rattle it, try it. It's up to you. Again, it's up to you to prevent the tracking. We are giving you some methods that we say might help you do a better job. These might make you more successful. Auto start slide, hello. How do we start that? There we go, thank you. So this is the small pool car. If you look at very small tires, uh, there's a better close up after it goes back down. And it's really, Driving on these things is nothing. People don't like the grates or these at first, but once you get them over them, it, it, it's amazing how easy it is to drive over them. That's a pretty small tire. And there's a close-up of the tire going over. And you see it, the tire, you can see if you look close, it's flexing. There's a slow motion part of this. It, it, I don't think it's on today's presentation, but the tire flexes a little bit. But that's a pretty small tire and it goes quite well over these things. So here's your installation detail. Minimum of 32 feet. They're manufactured, most of them 12 feet wide. Again, most of them. You can get a lot of these in 20 foot wide pieces too. And one thing we I think Kim touched on is make sure you have it rated. The metal grates, there's the one that you saw, I think is rated for about 125,000 pounds. And that's a lot of weight. Most of your vehicles will be fine. My, my low boy with the large excavator is going to weigh about 160,000 pounds. If I go over that, I will probably bend it. So there has to be an alternate exit, which probably goes back to, I said, you can only, you only have to be 12 foot wide, but you'll probably have that erosion control stone over the whole entrance. So if somebody for some reason has to bypass the manufactured device, they're still running over a tracking pad. And that's the easiest way to do it. Again, when you look at the detail, it talks about anchors. Uh, the metal grates probably won't need them. The FODs probably do. It shows the geotextile again, if you think you need it. And we do show this up at 50 feet wide, which we would like to see a little bit of stone before it. And again, we go back to our regular link, you need something. And on all these methods, we talk about stabilized surface to exit. Again, common sense, but you can't clean your tires and drive over bare earth again before you get to the, the highway or wherever you're going. You have to have a stabilized surface to get from whatever your track out control is to the public roadway. So monitor, I think we've talked about these. Accumulated sediment, I, I think um, a lot of these will go a long time. The grates will probably go a month, depending on the loads you have over it. The FODs, they have a cute little shovel that goes with it. I thought it was worthless, but you know, it takes 20 minutes. You have it cleaned out and you might do that once every two, three, four weeks. Um, if they shift, obviously, these are all very normal things common sense things, but they're things, of course, you should be thinking about if you're putting in manufactured devices. So from there, where do we go? Tire washing. Tire washing has always been a dirty word. Uh, oh, I don't want to do that. That's a lot of money and it makes a mess and it's a lot of maintenance. And you know, it is all of those things. I, I think it's hard to see on this slide. This is a prefab unit. So this part right here, this is buried in the ground about five feet. You can buy this unit Depending on the size and the flow, you might spend sixty, eighty thousand dollars to buy this unit, but then you have the unit. And if this particular unit, the sediment gets trapped underground, and you can see a little bit of a conveyor here. There's a conveyor built into it where it conveyors out the sediment. It'll deposit it where you need to take it and process it after that. But it's a fairly slick little unit. You can see a lot of water. Um, my guess is it's being used on this job. I see a lot of what look to be interstate bridges. So I'm thinking even though the tires are pretty clean on this truck entering, when you go over, over even a stabilized surface, you can have that little bit of fines from gravel and it creates a little bit of a slime maybe on the road. And my guess is they're trying to eliminate that. They're going into a very, very sensitive area and they want to have nothing at all on the tires. This works great for that. It, it, it's, it's, it's a good option. They're out there, they're available. We don't see a lot of them being used in Wisconsin yet, but we start seeing more and more. This is a direct excerpt from a paper done by Mark Kessner, and he was high, he presented this to the California Mining Association annual meeting in 2005. It was one of the best resources we could find for the different 
types of wheel washes. So you'll see in these slides, they're all probably in a mine. Well, he was presenting to a mining association. That was probably pretty smart on his part to have those photos, but it really shows you some of the different ways to do it. A flooded basin, you know, it's pretty simple in this slide. They basically have a depression in their asphalt. It's still asphalt. It's wet. They run through that and helps finish off the tire and clean it up a little bit before they exit. It's not, not a bad way. The countercurrent channel, you can see the tracks for the tires go through here. Obviously, the truck is coming towards you, and then the water shooting at it. So it's basically like running through a small flow of water. It does a great job. It's very simple. It'll do a great job of cleaning up your tires. Low pressure inundation wash, that's a little different. It looks like, uh, I don't know, a shower almost. What a low pressure inundation wash does is it's a high volume of water at low pressures. So you go through a lot of water in a mining application. It's great because you have a lot of areas for big wash basins where you can let it silt back out and pump back out. You wouldn't want to pump fresh water for this all the time. You'd go through it enormous amount of water, but it's a great application if you have a large area where you can have a settling pond for the water and just keep recirculating the water, it works great. And high pressure cleaning systems, this is a little simpler version of what you saw on the previous slide. It's a lot of, it's really very similar to what you see when you go through a touchless car wash. It, it's very similar to what you see there, maybe a couple extra nozzles. So what do you need to look at on that? Well, none of these systems that we've talked about so far, not one of them will clean all the sediment off a tire. You lots of times have to use combinations. It depends on your application. What do you want to do? How clean do you need? What are you trying to clean? What, what time of the year is it? With a washing station like this, the last thing we want, the very last thing we want is for you to clean up all your tires and then track water for two blocks in the middle of January and create an icing issue where we have accidents all over the place outside your job site. So you have to think about all the conditions and what's going on. Is, is there enough of a stabilized surface after that in the winter? time so that you can run some of the water off your tires before you go out on a public highway. It is an effective way to do it, but it's, again, not a silver bullet. None of these are perfect as far as removing sediment, and every job is so different for removing sediment. So one thing you will need to look at is where does this water go? You do need to handle it on site. You can't just run it down a storm sewer system. The uh, additives, there is a technical standard I am not qualified to speak to, but 1051 will tell you what you need to do about additives. You, and you're asking me what additives? Well, a lot of these systems, especially that first one I showed you, that self-contained system, they need to get the sediment out quickly. So there's flocculants that are added to the water. And that's a standard that they like to do. Well, you're adding something to the water, you need to know what you're adding and how you'll handle it and if it can be discharged. So that's something to keep in mind with, with the um, tire wash. The last bullet po point is something we had extensive conversations about is, you know, I don't wanna put in a system to clean tires and create a new hazardous material. Is this material hazardous? Um, I, I, I can't answer that for you, but what you're washing off is what's on the site. And the general consensus was from a clean site, we're washing the tires, you can return that sediment to the site. Now, all bets are off if you're on a contaminated site. If you are on a contaminated site, you better know what you're doing with your material, no matter what system you use. And my advice to you would be on a contaminated site is wherever you can, keep the vehicle, tires, tracks, et cetera, from contacting any of the contaminated soil. That is your best way to handle that problem. But it's something you need to think about. If you don't return the sediment to the site, and you're hauling off site, it's like any other material you haul off site, you have to make sure it's clean and where it's going and, and follow all the appropriate rules. So where do we use them? We talked about it a little bit. If, if you have really heavy haul, haul jobs, a lot of material, it's something you might want to think about. Sensitive resources, again, it's something you might want to think about, but you need to look at all the conditions of your site. How many loads? What type of trucks? What type of soil? If you could have a crystal ball and know if you're going to be working in a rainy season or a dry season or in 2018 where it's just rainy the whole year. Maintenance, a little more maintenance to these. You have clogged hoses, water levels, accumulated sediment. Um, some of these systems take it out real easily. Other ones, you just have to pull it out. It's not the end of the world. Flocculants, um, if it's a manufactured unit like the first one, there will be uh, recommendations. It's not horrible, but there is a little more maintenance. And of course, what I talked about is ice. We, we want to be really careful about what we're doing outside our sites too. We don't want to solve one problem and create another one. 
okay, I, I added this. Um, this is not extraordinary. This happens a lot on sites. And, and we put in considerations, number three, verbatim says, manual removal of sediment from vehicles may be needed when working in heavy mud cannot be avoided. So you might say, well, whoever does that? Well, I, I'll tell you, it happens a lot on job sites. We work a lot on multi-million dollar commercial sites. And, and if you're familiar with them, a lot of them have, for uh, the example I use is, is uh, precast concrete structural members. And when you put those on a commercial site, you have to schedule that and order that for manufacturer months and months ahead of time. And you are given a delivery date and that is when you will take your delivery. And unfortunately, there's another multi-million dollar site right after you the next week that is scheduled for delivery and they need those trucks that next week and the next week and the next week. What I'm getting at is there's severe penalties, severe penalties if you don't take your precast on the date you were supposed to take it. And if you're familiar with precast sites, usually it's picked off the truck by the crane and set in place. So you will have occasions where you have to get a truck into the site no matter what. And, and this is pretty ugly. Uh, this is pretty ugly. And I'd like someone to tell me which one of the systems I just went over would clean this because I'm not aware of one. And that's why this is in the technical standard. There, there, there are always going to be situations you have to adapt to. On this one, in my opinion, you need laborers on this site. If you have to get these trucks in, you need a laborer on that site with a bar and a shovel and manually get in there and pull the majority of that out before it gets to the track out control. And you might even want to consider having a, a hose with a sprayer there for that laborer too, so he can get everything he can out of that tire. If you have to get in the site, no matter what, then you have to have some extraordinary measures, no matter what. We even talked about, would it be possible to say under certain circumstances, you cannot access that site because you will create a mess. And we went to this instead. Again, it's performance. It's up to you to keep the track out off the street. And there are ways to do this. So other way that I know of, the only other way I really know of to clean that tire is centrifugal force. And that's going about 30, 40 miles an hour down the street and, and letting it fly out. And that is not acceptable. So, so of those two systems, you pretty much have to get the laborer there with a the bar and, and take it out, unless you come up with something else. So what happens when some of the sediment escapes site? That's reality. Uh, we've shown, shown you a lot of, this is in theory what we'd love to see, but in reality, sediment gets out there. There's a lot of ways to clean it up. Uh, the old standard was broom or shovel clean. The new standard is broom or shovel clean. What we talked about is there's a lot of ways to do it. Uh, there's a lot of things to think about. Control the dust, of course. We don't want to take a sediment problem and create an air problem. Um, end of each workday, you should be monitoring your site. If you have heavy hauling, if you have anything going on, somebody should be looking at the site of e end of every day. And if there's a lot of hauling, you should be monitoring it during the day. We need to keep the sediment on the site. And when you don't, this is the last resort, but the last resort has to be taken care of. And the sediment should be returned to the site. You may say, well, that's obvious. Well, it's, it's not really. You look at all the different methods. That angle broom that I showed you before is right here. It's really easy to sweep it off into a gutter or, or easier yet down into a ditch. That sediment does not belong in the gutter left there. It does not belong in the ditch. It needs to be picked up and returned to the site. It's real easy to sweep it off to the gutter at the end of each day and say, well, I'll pick it up when I get enough accumulated, but then a rainstorm comes along you don't expect, and now the sediment is in the storm sewer system or the ditches or it's conveying somewhere where you don't want it. Uh, so, so that's important. Uh, this slide really is about, there's different systems out there. This is a vac truck. Uh, they're a lot more common now. They work great, very little dust. They don't usually work as well on heavy clots of, of clay or mud. So it may work on your site, it may not. This is the typical street sweeper. They work really great. They work great. Costs about $250,000 to buy a new one. The attachments for the skid steers, maybe 10, 12, $15,000. So you end up seeing a lot of these on job sites and they do a fine job. This one, this dust is probably getting to be a little too much. Most of these today you can buy with a water tank and spray nozzles with all the silica um, standards that have come about probably have that today with, with a water tank on it. You won't see all that dust. Uh, it does a great job. It cleans really well. This one's called a pickup broom. There's a lot of other names, but it's basically a dust pan back here with a broom in the front and the broom rotates the other way towards the skid steer to put it into the bucket. They both work. They both have applications. When you go to spec out a job, 
I think it's really hard to tell somebody that they have to have a quarter million dollar machine sitting on a job site. Again, it goes back to methods and means and where, where you want to let your contractor, <clears throat> excuse me, be as efficient as they possibly can. And, and you're trying not to add job costs. You're trying to get the job done without adding job costs. We're trying to make it easier and actually more cost effective by giving you all these options so that you can actually control your erosion control without spending more money. And do these two methods work? Absolutely. Positively, this is the standard, shovel and broom clean, right? So on, on small tracking, on small areas, absolutely works. And if some contractor comes up there and tells you, well, I'm going to put 30 people on the road, and I'm going to shovel it up and broom it up, and they get the result, I guess that's up to them. I, I wouldn't recommend it, but again, it, this is results driven. If they're doing it, then they need to be out there more often because they're obviously tracking a little bit too much material out onto the street. And I think that's it for me, am I right? So thanks, Chris. Um, just to kind of quickly run through a, f a few things that are kind of not either not pra practice specific or um, are common to all of them, all of the practices. Um, we do have a consideration that says that you can use other methods as long as they're not creating other problems. Um, Chris already talked about the overweight, oversized vehicles. If you have adverse conditions, you can use these practices in series. Um, when you're doing heavy hauling, you need more maintenance. We've got some considerations. In the consideration section, we've got some um, information about different street cleaning options um, based on experience. And there's also a consideration that if you have an extended um, internal to the site driveway, um, such as this with some sediment control, so that anything that washes off the road um, doesn't discharge off site, that is also a track out option. Um, for all of these, you need to have enough information in the plans and specifications that the contractor knows what's accepted or what's expected. And as you change entrances, you need to adjust the erosion control so that all of the exits are covered. And you should be marking up the erosion control plan on site. And one thing that I tend to tell engineers is get it on the plans because it's, if, it's, if it's in a report off somewhere, the contractor may not see it. Put it on the plans. Uh, common maintenance, you're going to want to monitor this daily. We didn't say inspection because you've got your weekly inspections and your post rain event inspections. This is more of keeping an eye on it and doing whatever maintenance needs to be done. If you're getting a lot of track out, that's a clue that probably something needs to be maintained, whether it's a stone tracking pad or a manufactured device, you need to be doing something more. Um, some of the um, devices and mats can be reused. Um, you, you probably want to consider um, cleaning those off before you take them to the next site just so you don't spread invasive species. Um, signage and fencing you may need just to get people to use things the way you want them to use. And then we've already covered some practice specific maintenance. So um, this, this live webinar is available for um, PDH and um, CEU credit. If you want a certificate, if you need a certificate to document the continuing ed, please email Penny and her email is up here, penny at wisconsinlandwater.org. And for those that need credit for um, the trades certification for commercial building inspector, dwelling contractor qualifier, and UDC construction inspector, DSPS has approved the live webinar for 
that for credit for that for an hour. And for those, Penny will send you when you request, you'll need to include your credential number with your request for continuing ed credit. And she, Penny will send you via email a, a quiz that you'll need to complete and get seven out of 10 correct. So questions, we have some that are in writing. So the first one is for winter tracking and what to do with snow and ice complications. Is that something you want to talk about, Chris? Okay, we're, clearly I am the lowest on the totem pole here, so I got that question. Uh, snow and ice is a problem. It is always a problem, and it complicates all of these. I wish I had an easy answer. Uh, you have to try to keep your site clean. You'll have to try to keep your exit road clean. And, and yes, will a little snow in the tracking pad, for example, kill it? No, but a lot of snow and ice will. And, and you'll probably have to rough it up a little more often. It's always a problem. And it's always will be a problem in Wisconsin. I, I wish I had a better answer for you than just that. Uh-oh. Is the preferred stone gradation a standard aggregate material? It, it is in South Central Wisconsin. South Central Wisconsin, it's, uh, I can't remember, it's City of Madison if it's gradation one, two, or three. I have it in my notes here somewhere. I can get that later. So in the, in the Dane County area, it absolutely is. Is it a standard gradation statewide? Probably not. And that's why I said it's, it's, it's not mandatory, it's preferred. And we're saying if you can get a stone around that size, it will probably do the best job for you if you're especially looking to get the general public through there. If you have a stone, a local stone, and it will save the project money and it's similar to these stones, by all means, use it. Use something that will give you the results that you're looking for. But uh, I, I don't know what they have in Northwest Wisconsin if they have a stone like that. I'm sure there's something similar. More questions? Uh, there's a question here about will there be an updated CAD detail and specification document that we can put in our drawings. We do not have a lot of CAD capabilities here at the department. Um, so, um, and we typically are not writing specifications for projects. Um, that would need to be something that um, that would need to be something that um, that um, other agents, either DOT, most of what we have, most of what we have is similar to what DOT has. Um, we do have drawings in the technical standard. We have some figures and you can base your drawings off of that, but um, they were done in a lot of cases in other um, programs just because we don't have um, a lot of access to CAD um, software. What is the sufficient length of using an existing gravel driveway for track out control? Well, I think the question is, um, is it working? Is it is the mud falling off before you get to the end of the road? If it's not, then you need to do something more. Um, hold on, have more answer coming. Hi, the standard does say a minimum of 150 feet. So the very minimum you can do for that is 150 feet. But as Amy said, if it's not working, it may need to be longer. It may need to be much longer. But we're trying to recognize the fact that there are a lot of internal roads or it might be cheaper for you to build an internal road than to worry about some other things. But the standard calls for a minimum of 150 feet of length. Thank you. Is there anybody, any other questions out there? 
I see one more on the um, on the list here. Um, same question, but for existing asphalt parking or drive, is there a specific length that can be used as track out? And I think um, the answer is really, really the 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 same answer. Um, it it needs to work. But we've got that 150 feet is in the stand, is in the considerations, and always make sure that you know where the dirt that's coming off that existing asphalt is going because we don't want it in a ditch, we don't want it in an inlet, um, and you're probably going to want to run your street cleaner along that length if you're starting to accumulate sediment on it. Okay, I think that looks like it's about it. I don't see anybody. Thanks, Rick Eilerson. Hello out there, Rick. Um, great job, he said to Amy, Kim, Chris, and Penny. So thank you for that, Rick. Have a good day. Um, I think we're gonna close her down, everyone. So if you have any questions, my email is one of the best ways um, to contact us. And if I don't have the answer, I will certainly find someone that does. So have a great afternoon and thanks presenters for a great presentation.